Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the session, which will be a roundtable. We have different panelists that will introduce themselves. So the question we want to ask to the panelists, and, and we hope that you will love their answers, uh, is around the containers and how they're representing future of infrastructure as a service, and how do they position themselves with regard to other technologies. And so for this roundtable, we have, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it will come. We have four, three panelists. Uh, here it is. Simona on the left hand side, Jerome in the middle, and David on the right hand side. For me, so it's a reverse for you, of course. <laughs> and they will introduce themselves, coming from different angles, uh, working on different technologies. So they will introduce themselves, and then we will ask questions. And if you want to make the discussion interactive, feel free also to raise your hand and ask questions. And I will repeat them so that they can be recorded, and, and the panelists will, will give you answers to, to those questions. Simona, can you start? Yeah, sure. Is this working? OK. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm actually really excited to be here. And I want to thank Bruno as well for the invitation. Um, I work as a product manager for SUSE. And I will just take one minute to introduce SUSE. I would love that everyone knows. Or let me first ask, do you know what SUSE is? OK. <laughs> Um, so I work at SUSE as a product manager. I have uh, been doing product management in different areas from um, the maintenance side of the classical operating system, moving into um, developing a service pack, so a version of the operating system, and now building a platform for containers. And that's the primary reason why, why I'm here to talk about containers and our vision um, for containers. OK. Shalom. Hi, so I'm Jerome Pitazzoni, and I work for Docker. I do mostly evangelism these days, so you might have seen me in how to get your microservices working on containers without blowing up everything. Things that I'm not doing anymore, but uh, Brett and uh, Laura that were well, here in, in the room are doing a workshop about that, so I recommend you to check it out if that's the kind of thing you want to do. Um, but before doing that, I was doing um, ops at Dot Cloud, the company that became Docker, and before that, I was doing mostly development. And I feel like this kind of uh, discussion for me is a kind of back to the future because almost 12 years ago, I was trying to build infrastructure as a service uh, back in France in the small company that I had, and we were also looking at that thing. Um, look, everything like UML and uh, not the, the thing to build your diagram, but user mode Linux, which was a kind of ancestor of containers. Um, so I, I feel like we might have achieved full circle here. David? Hello, I am David Flanders um, of the OpenStack Foundation. Um, so I primarily work on the container and platform as a services that get connected to the OpenStack APIs. So I work a lot with SDKs and different developer communities from lots of different programming languages trying to understand how they want to connect um, this plethora of uh, container choice that we have with all the different um, stateless features and tools out there. Last I saw, there's about 70 Gartners tracking about 70 different um, container and platform, different services and modules and things like that. So it's a very confusing space. Um, and yet, I think that we're obviously going to see um, a lot of filters going on where we're going to need to make some choices. I'm, I'm a big believer in the fact that I think we're, we need to move towards a kind of LAMP stack for the cloud. Um, and so I'm, I'm genuinely excited to be chatting with Simona and Jerome on how we do integrate all of these technologies and how we start to build this new LAMP stack for the cloud so we have uh, the true open source that we want to be able to build the things that, that we love building with the, the computer and the web. OK, so my first question for, for you would be around the, uh, the low-level tools that you need to build that stack. So uh, we have bare metal systems, we have virtual machines, and we have containers now. Uh, how do you position them? How do you see their usefulness uh, with regards to each other? Where are the key points for you around those technologies? And, and maybe, David, you can go Sure. On. So I, I think the most important thing to remember here is that we do work in a space that does change a lot. So compute modalities um, will 
we have very old compute modalities. You heard uh, Linus talk about, and, and uh, Alan, uh, head of SUSE, talk about mainframes. You know, so I, I worked in universities for a long time, and you know, there are mainframes still kicking around. Likewise, we still have virtual machines and a lot of you know, enterprise uh, legacy applications running on those. Uh, bare metal, especially as it relates to uh, things like GPUs and being able to use new compute modalities are coming into play more and more to experiment with. And of course, containers. Um, and a lot of people you know, think OpenStack doesn't love containers. We love containers and containers love OpenStack. We, we are building OpenStack better with containers um, from just a point of view of being able to uh, m update it, to keep it uh, modular and being able to allow more people to use it. And likewise, we're putting container containers on top. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I also, and I just came from a, a conference on edge computing, where we are starting to talk about all the new compute modalities coming down the line. You know, um, things like uh, uh, wire, um, node array computing and being able to do that. Um, smaller compute modalities, things like serverless and functional computing. Uh, and then also the, looking kind of in the far future, I think we've, we've got quantum computing. IBM's just launched, you know, a cloud that you can actually go and start using qubits right now and start playing with quantum, so quantum's here. So I think we're going to continue to see these new compute modalities for all the use cases that we see, and we're just getting more and more use cases. You know, it is getting bigger and bigger. So for me, I'm, I'm actually genuinely excited. These past five years have been a, a lot of just making virtualization work and making containers work and making bare metals work, and we're starting to see a whole new set of compute modalities open up. So I'm, I'm genuinely excited about that. I think that generally everyone is really excited about this. Now, um, what we are seeing with our, on our customer base is that everything is going to be a journey. So we should not expect that even if the technology is extremely cool and is proven to, to be working and bringing all the benefits like improving uh, productivity, uh, bringing the innovation back to the organization and so on, for some organization it will take a while to get and build their container ecosystem and container architecture. And you know, we started. We are talking about infrastructure as a service, and I would like to maybe do a little bit of detour to talk about how we ended up with containers and everything. So, I think that all of you in the room already know that um, you know inf managing an infrastructure it's usually a very risky task, and uh, it's, it brings a lot of responsibility to a sysadmin. Um, new concept like continuous integration they sounded really cool, but those can be really dangerous when you use them on mission critical infrastructure. Um, and the reason for that is because your, your infrastructure, which is critical for your business, might not be available once you do a patch and you cannot have the mechanism ready to roll to roll back easier. That's why, and we are seeing that on the operating system. We know we are always exciting about new versions of the operating system, but large organization and enterprising running um, thousands of servers are not going to roll out our newer version that in the immediate next day after the release. They will usually do it gradually with a lot of testing, making sure that the critical infrastructure is still up and running. Now, historically, applications have been linked with the infrastructure, and historically, at the application level, we have inherited all those rules on the infrastructure. Um, and I, I, I bet to say that in the last 20 years, we tried to decouple um, the application and make, allow the application to be more rapid and develop itself, embrace the agility, the continuous integration, and everything, while the infrastructure on the infrastructure level, we continue to keep it stable and reliable. That's why we still have this, uh, usually at SUSE, when we talk about DevOps, we try to explain to everyone why this is usually a fight between operation and developers and why we want to embrace them as a, as a core concept. Um, now, when we look at what's happening now in the market, and this is what with OpenStack and so on, what happened is the innovation needed to hit the infrastructure, and we needed to find a way to automate and to bring all this application innovation that we had built around with agility and so on on the infrastructure level, allow the sysadmin to have tools and automation and stable solution they can rely on so that they can get the same agility as the developers have on the other hand. Um, and you know, when we talk about cloud and application in the cloud, everything that could be an easy fruit, everything that could be easily put into the cloud, as an, either as a container or as a virtual machine, I bet to say it's already there. If you have a small website, your marketing campaign, stuff like this are already in the cloud. But what we are seeing now is that organizations, 
they, they want to continue this, this journey and they are looking at uh, what we call more enterprises or the, their mission critical application. Mm -hmm. And today it's not easy to put a legacy billing system in a, yeah. in a cloud and not even talk about containers. Some find the easy solution of just checking a box saying, here's my container strategy, I take my legacy Oracle si system, I put it into a container, I put this in the container in a VMware, I run it on top of OpenStack and I have the task done. Yes, it's true. It is um, a way of doing it, but you don't yet gain the full agility that a microservices approach or a modular approach will, will bring you. So that's what we are seeing today, that customers are struggling on defining their architecture of how to embrace containers on top of infrastructure as a service. Um, so for us at SUSE, infrastructure as a service is core to the future of the <coughs> software-defined data center. Yeah. Alan has shown the, the slide. We usually have it on all our presentation. We have, at the, at, as the first pillow, the operating system. Everything, we still need an operating system to run everything. Mm -hmm. But the second pillow, it's, a, it's an infrastructure as a service. And then we go up the stack with containers, with Kubernetes, with Cloud Foundry. And then you get a solution, or you get different solution depending on your needs. So that will be, in a couple of words, our vision. So uh, as you can see, we kind of all agree that the future of containers and IAS are deeply intertwined. Uh, so the, I feel like the, the, the good question would be more about how, like how, how do we get there and what are the things we can do uh, to, to, to get some interesting results. Uh, and um, I think uh, one, one observ interesting observation is to think about the fact that the biggest and most successful uh, public IS infrastructures are built on top of containers. Uh, if you take Google Cloud, um, it's when, you, when you start a VM on Google Cloud, uh, it's starting on, on, on top of something that looks like a container that is using C groups and other mechanisms that are the same mechanisms used by uh, containers to make sure that this container only has access to a specific amount of resources. Uh, there is an orchestrator, which is Borg, which is the... Uh, the, the kind of um, ancestor of Kubernetes. Uh, so Google Cloud um, is built on top, is running on top of containers, which is kind of uh, the reverse of what we could uh, think at first. It's like, oh, I'm going to run my containers uh, in VMs, obviously. Yeah. But these people are running VMs in containers. That's interesting. And if we look at another huge successful public cloud, Amazon, uh, it's, uh, it's not running on top of containers per se, but when you start a VM, uh, you indicate a machine image, which is really close to a container image. And when, whenever you want to start a VM, you always have to uh, specify that image. And those images can be made from uh, running VMs. So you, you create them the same way that, that you create container images, kind of. So the, the life cycle of those VMs uh, is really close to the life cycle of containers, especially if you want to do it right, and by do it right, I mean in the like DevOps ways, immutable infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So IAS and containers, I, I think at some point will become almost impossible to distinguish in some way, uh, because the, the perfect uh, scenario, if I, if I wanted to deploy something tomorrow, I, I, wouldn't, I don't want to choose between containers and IAS. I want both, because I have some legacy work, uh, workloads that run in VM, and sure, I could put them in containers, but that would just be lipstick on a pig. That thing is still a VM. And I also have new workflows that are containers, and I would like to um, address both workflows from the single uh, control plane and, and see them in a kind of homogeneous way. Uh, and the, the last thing that will um, probably elicit some reaction from my neighbor uh, will be about, so OpenStack, for instance, has this reputation of being complicated to operate. Kubernetes is getting there as well. And so it would be interesting to see if we can take some really simple uh, container primitives, for instance, uh, Swarm has the reputation of being really simple to, to deploy, and now see, okay, can we layer uh, something like OpenStack or some kind of IAS on top of that? Can we get either a simple way to 
uh, deploy and operate OpenStack thanks to those low-level container orchestration mechanisms? Uh, or can we get an even simpler IAS thing uh, that will let me start VMs as easily as I start container by doing like Docker run, blah, blah, and then uh, 10 seconds later, I have a VM up and running on, on my infrastructure? So it, I, I, I actually really agree with this. We're, we're playing with all of this right now at OpenStack. And what's really getting excited, what's happened with Kubernetes and with Docker and with those 70 other companies out there who are now doing container solutions is that we're getting a lot of experimentation. It's kind of like the, the Cretaceous period of speciation inside of the way you build your applications. So things I've just seen already, and Jerome's actually had a great example, Borg, still using VMs with containers. Amazon still using VM containers. We're mixing and matching, and there is that kind of blending going where you almost can't tell the difference, right? Because there are things in VMs which are really brilliant, some of the old security layer stuff that goes inside of there and all the rest of that. Uh, and there are brilliant things for the statelessness and what you want to achieve with containers. So I think, actually, Simone, you hit, you hit the nail on the head as well, is it's about walking people through that journey as we get there. Now, if you want to check out some cool stuff that is starting to happen with this blending, I've seen, for example, OpenStack Cinder, which is uh, our project for being able to do uh, database backends, or sorry, not database, but storage backends. Uh, Cinder's been working for seven years now, and they've been working on actually creating over 80 different driver profiles so that when vendors come up with new compute and want to sell it, you can just grab Cinder, put Swarm on top, off you go. And that's incredible for me to be, just be able to do that kind of lightweight experimentation. All of a sudden, you're seeing web companies again who are able to build their own little clouds just by using a couple of modules and things like that. They don't want to just use utility computing. They actually want to still have their own thing so that they can touch and work with it. So we are getting to an era now. And again, I go back to this kind of lamp stack example where you know Linux doing all the work. Linus, what is he doing day on and day out? He's making sure that drivers plug in so that we can have more computers utilizing this stuff, broadening the scope, enabling more people. That's exactly what OpenStack is doing. You look at Cinder, Swift, Nova, Glance, all of those are trying to work with hardware vendors to make sure we can plug the hardware stuff in so that you can use these things. And then as we get into, you know, the Apache, you know, back in the day it was the Apache web server, Docker and Kubernetes and CoreOS and Tectonic and all of these companies, they're starting to provide that interoperable Apache web service thing. We still got a ways to go, you know, like what does scripting on the web look like? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm been trying to keep my eye on serverless and functional. Maybe that'll kind of fulfill the P in the LAMP stack, you know? When will we get to a place where databases will be, you know, truly serverless? There's some brilliant uh, um, cockroach DB, I think, is doing some really cool stuff now around this. I'm sure Docker has got some things as well. So the, my advice to anyone on, on about this kind of thinking about IaaS versus containers is, it's not an or, it's an and. Just like the LAMP stack, you had a bunch of different foundations, you had Apache in there, you had Linux in there, you had MySQL, you had all the different you know, programming languages. All of those are separate groups, separate foundations. They're not gonna be consumed by one company. We don't want them to be consumed by one company or just one foundation. We want them all working together in correspondence. So just remember that when you're kind of going out there and people are saying, are you using Kubernetes? or are you using uh, Docker, or are you using OpenStack? No, it's an and, it's an and. We, we're using bits and pieces from all of this, and most importantly, like good engineers, we're letting the best technologies actually prove themselves. So, so what will make the customer choose one technology versus another? Is it, is it typically the type of applications they are developing? So Jerome mentioned the lipstick effect on, uh, on, on traditional application used in container mode. So do you think that you really need to tie containers to cloud native type of applications and that legacy application will never benefit from containers? Or, I mean, you have a, at Docker, you have the, the MTA program that you introduced. So, so some people, at least at Docker, seem to think, seem to think that it's possible to, to build legacy yeah. application with containers. So. So the, the MTA program is super interesting. Um, at first, when I was pitched the program, I was like, what, what is this? this? That doesn't make sense to me. And, and then I, rem I remembered a very important moment when I was virtualizing stuff for customers maybe 10-ish years ago. 
And um, one day I was tasked with virtualizing some, I think, an NT server or something like that. The hardware was 10 years old and it was about to explode. And mm -hmm. we're like, okay, if this machine dies, uh, we lose, I don't know if it was accounting or time off or so, from something important for the company. And we're like, okay, we need to virtualize that just to save that machine because it's, in, it's impossible to, to get that running on, on new hardware. And um, I, I'm not really a Windows kind of person, so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in for the whole weekend. And then one of my friends told me, oh, you just should try this software. I can't remember the name, but it was a P2V thing. And, uh, oh, what, what is that? Oh, that's a physical to virtual. You just run that on your server, and it's going to work for a few hours, maybe days if it's really slow, and then it will just like spit out a nice VMDK or whatever, uh, a VM image that you can run on your thing. And I'm like, that seems like science fiction to me, and <laughs> I don't think that will work, but for now, this is my best bet to get that anti stuff running on Xen I had, I think. And it worked. And I, I was like, well, I, I'm glad I didn't say anything stupid, like I will eat my own shoes if that thing works. <laughs> and, and so I think um, the, what we're trying to do with the MTA program is something similar. So at first, it's like, wait a minute, when I'm counterizing an application, I should carefully write a Docker file and um, like optimize the way I lay out the instructions, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that's when you do it the cloud native way, but you can also take an existing VM and you can like get that VM in a container image. And of course you won't get like this super nice Docker file that rebuilds everything in an optimized way, etc. But it's getting there. Uh, the first step is just get that container and put it in the VM, and, oh, sorry, the other way around, take the VM and cram it in the container. And then little by little, we improve the tooling so that in, in the process, we can get either a Docker file or the equivalent recipe um, to be closer and closer to what uh, a, a good professional artisan would do if, if they were Dockerizing in the first place. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm glad that uh, I had this experience uh, almost a decade ago about uh, virtualizing physical machines because it gives me trust in the fact that, uh, trust and faith in the fact that, yes, we are going to take those VMs and we are going to put them in containers. And some of them, we will just like, it's a kind of fire and forget thing. Now the VM is in a container and we will never touch it again because it's been running for years and years and that we have no reason to rebuild that thing ever. And sometimes we're like, okay, we need to like make this application like to, to um, uh, maintain and improve it over time. And so we will progressively transform that VM into a proper uh, container. But so, yeah, I, that, I think that's the one, one possible path in this journey. Mm. And I think what's important is to define what is a legacy application. And yeah. this is what you mentioned. So sometimes uh, for, many, for some organization, it is much cheaper to just continue to support legacy by a vendor um, than to look at this legacy and touch it. Touching it means I need to rebuild the knowledge. I need to check the documentation. I need to realize, oops, it it wasn't documented for the last 14 years, so it's much easier to say, okay, this is the amount I'm paying for this application to this vendor, and it's going to be supported until I can decommission. And uh, in my experience at SUSE, this is the happy case if you are in the setup where you can say, I will support this application for the next seven years, and then it's naturally decommissioned because we only have a couple of customers or something like this. What do you see more and um, more and more often is you do have a legacy application that it's actually one of your mission critical application, yeah. like a billing system, like something that is core to the business. And there, even if we call it legacy, it still requires enhancements. It still requires work on. And one of the things that you are looking at at the moment is how do I balance those two? So how do I maintain this application up and running? Because I cannot just you know shut it down. The business is going to go down the next day. Um, and how do I move this into a more, um, you know, cloud native friendly setup? And this is the, I would say, the new type of legacy where containers can help and where um, I agree with Jeremy that it's a nice way to use containers as a first step. So, and look, I, I think it, I, I couldn't agree more with this. You know, 
developers, we naturally get in this debate about what's better, the VM or the container or you know, functional or serverless, and we, we, get, we get obsessed with these things because it, it does affect us and it emotionally hurts us when you know, the thing breaks and all the rest of it. But really, smart, smart organizations have smart, smart product managers like Simona who actually understand that journey and the cost. And that's, that's one of the real things that I think we, we can't forget about the most is that what is containers really pushing out there as a value proposition? And for me, it's portability of application. And so having someone who understands, okay, we do, you know, this, this is just an enterprise thing and it's used internally inside the organization and people access it via the one way and we're not too concerned about it. It's when we actually start to think about containers from the point of view of, um, in the future, I want our organization to be cost ready to be able to jump around to the different clouds that we'll need and, and how we'll want them. And that, that's what we should all really care about. If you're here at the open source conference and you kind of feel in the, the economics of open source, the economics says that we should actually be able to take our applications and move them around and not just be stuck in one platform. So more than anything else, I feel like we should be, when you come to the decision points of should I be just throw it in the VM and, and use, some, use some magic to be able to just get it in the VM and use it versus put in the additional cost and time and developer time to make sure that you're you're moving towards a, uh, a stateless application which containers can provide if you get all the components in, though it's very difficult, it's time, it takes a lot of time, it takes very smart to developers to do it, but if you can get it into that container portability, then all of a sudden you're starting to make your organization cost-proof. You're able to say, oh, well, today we're using uh, Amazon and now we're gonna add Azure as, as another infrastructure provider. And yeah, we, we actually do want to have um, OpenStack also as a, a private cloud there because it holds a bunch of sensitive secret financial data and we, we really cannot allow that to be, to be um, put out in any other organization, maybe because of data sovereignty inside of a country or um, because of um, security reasons. So let's not forget about the, the actual economics of containers and the fact that it's about portability and, and enabling us all to have a better economic open source future. So I had one question back for you, Simona. So at Suzy, you had all the offering. You, ha you have a, a, an OpenStack-based solution. You have your CAS solution. You have your PaaS solution. How do you advise customers with regards to all those different options? What, what do you, where you tell them you should choose that type of products rather than th that type of product based on the technology, based on, on the application, on the life cycle of the application? Well, we usually talk about their project and their, and their um, ultimate goals. And it's all a matter of, of choice. So there are customers who really want to start the journey, and they are even satisfied today with all, only the container engine. And we have that offering as well. So they only say, I want to give it a try. I'm just going to put a couple of containers here, and that is the operating system plus the container engine. Then we have customers who are looking into the transformation, and that's why I was talking about this infrastructure transformation, and then they are um, evaluating OpenStack. And we are really proud to be one of the first OpenStack distribution and contributing to the OpenStack solution. But nowadays we have customers who are coming back and saying, uh, you know, everything is really complex. And I used to get the, uh, an operating, a stable, reliable enterprise operating system from you guys. And now I actually have to deal with all, okay, what exactly do I want and so on. Those are usually the customers who are looking for a full platform as a service. Where already the, the log management is set up, the monitoring tool, it's, it's embedded. And you know, the, the, the task that uh, it's on the sysadmin or the, the task list for the sysadmin is really reduced because this all comes as embedded full um, solution provided by SUSE. And that's the value of a platform as a service, or how we call it nowadays, it's a cloud native application platform. Um, this will embrace this will um, embrace the latest technology. This will help customers run on different solutions so they can run it on the public cloud or they can decide it to build it together with YAS. Uh, on their own private cloud. And it all depends on the, cu the ultimate customer needs and how they want to get there. Uh, we are aware that more than 50% of containers today are running in public clouds. So it's still a journey of you know, transitioning from um, a standard or legacy usually application and, and set up to the new cloud native solution. Um, and one thing that we realized, and that's why we have, probably we have a unique setup where we have a cast and a pass and 
we don't want to play around with the terms and saying that the cost is the past and so on. Um, we have identified the need in the market to have um, automation for containers. And this is where we build the container as a service platform. And on top of this, we are going to have the platform as a service. The main difference is a container as a service is really focusing only on containers, and it comes with very minimal that you need in order to run your containers, where a platform as a service is focusing on your developers and comes with all the tools that your developers need in order to run their application. And you no longer have to worry about what is happening underneath. That's something that a vendor like SUSE will do for you. Okay. Um, Sharon, any feedback on that? Any so additional uh, thought? There is one thing, like when, when you said, um, it's pretty important to know what applications we want to put in containers. And that's, that's one thing um, that uh, we're also trying to do within this MTA program, like modernized traditional applications. Uh, and this is more for people who have lots of applications. So uh, for, for many of us, we have maybe just like one big website or maybe a, a dozen of applications, so that's, that's not us. But for the organizations that have hundreds or thousands of applications, uh, finding out which ones are good candidates uh, to be put in containers can be just by itself a daunting task. Yeah. So we we worked on tools for that uh, to can do some kind of audit on on this uh, uh, application landscape, so to speak, and say, okay, um, with a, a bunch of pretty straightforward heuristics, um, we can kind of score these applications, and then you can uh, start working on the ones that are on top. Uh, it won't tell you exactly, yes, no, you can containerize that or not. That's not exactly the point. It's more to know immediately, okay, I'm going to uh, get a good ROI and leverage benefits, and et cetera, et cetera, on this, on, the, on this pool of applications. So I can start working there and then work my way um, slowly to the applications that will be less good candidates, but eventually will get there as well. So, so in your opinion, there is no restriction to put any workload inside a container environment. You, you, don't, you don't feel that there is room anymore for virtual machines or? Um, I think there is no restriction, but it doesn't mean there is no room for virtual machines. The container has to run somewhere anyway. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it will be in a VM, sometimes it will be on bare metal. Uh, sometimes it, at some point it might be in some abstraction that is even different. Um, so, I mean, it, for now, it's, it's still a kind of um, um, in the sidelines, but uh, for training purposes, we have a lot of things that run Docker in Docker. So we have containers that run on top of containers, and I think those containers then run on top of VMs um, that if you run them on Google, then they will run in containers. Um, so uh, that doesn't mean that we should encapsulate things like all the way down. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, everything can be in containers. There is no doubt about it. Now, should it be, uh, the, the answer kind of depends on how you want to look at things. Like if, if you have a, a hammer, it's better if everything is a nail. So if you want to, to manage uh, a large number of containers, uh, it's great if you pick something that is very well suited for that. And the last few things that don't look like quite containers, then we will make them look like containers. Uh, so that, but but it doesn't mean that you have to put everything in containers. Yeah, and one, just one quick comment. Uh, we have noticed that some customers prefer to put containers in VMs for um, isolation and for security reasons. Uh, uh. They have already existing security policies in place that it will take a while to change them because usually it comes with regulation changes yeah. and we all know how long this discussion can take. And for the time being, because they want to embrace containers for their development of their application, they prefer to iso isolate them within VMs and fulfill all their regulations. So just as a comment, that's, that sometimes is mandatory. Um, so what one thing, and Simona, I actually want to kind of ask you a question a little bit here as well, because it's interesting to talk about the difference between CAS and PASS. And I think you kind of talked about it, and correct me please, but PASS are more for, I guess, the DevOps and, and being able to manage that, and CAS are more for your, your people who just are specifically working on container applications, or let, let's, let's have a little bit of a, a talk about that, because I, I think this is what really interests me is 
the groups of people who are going to use these different layers, right? So as we start to build layers on top of the IaaS, it is about trying to bring together your DevOps and your app dev and your usability experts and your users and your product managers and your communications people and all the rest of it. So I'm interested to see if you're seeing anything from your customers in regards to those kind of different modalities. Right, so the way we implement it, and that's probably specific to SUSE, it's um, our CAS solution, it's relatively quite simple. So we have an operating system, the container engine, and our or orchestration for that. Everything on top of this, it's something where we work with partners, and the, cust the end customer can choose between the variety of partners that are already out there. While the PaaS solution comes already with, with um, CICD included, with log management, with monitoring already included, whereas the customer you can not necessarily uh, choose any other solution. Excellent. We've got some, we've got some audience questions. Yeah. Yes. One we question. finally engaged you. Everyone woke up. Um, I, I just want to ask the panel about uh, how do you think about complexity in the, in the, uh, with the introduction of containers and uh, virtual machines and so on? Because obviously complexity increases with uh, with uh, having several layers, but also it kind of simp uh, it decreases in some sense. Portability is obviously a, a keyword here, but uh, in my ideal world, it would be better if we didn't have to to do all that portability stuff. If we could make the applications portable and have just one OS and everything would run like that, but yeah. that's not the real. You, you ever yeah. seen the XKCD cartoon where it's like, oh, you know, all we need is another standard. Uh, so there's 12 standards, and now there's 13 standards. So we're already into that with containers. We we had that with VMs, and we have all of our different you know distros. But I, I think one of the, to address the complexity question, so this, this is my two pence. Um, the, the thing that we really, right now I feel like we are in a phase where we look at VMs and we say, can this VM go into this container? And that's a very one-to-one -one pattern ratio. And that's not the way you want to actually build serverless applications or 12-factor applications. And we're in a phase now where everybody's starting to have this debate and this conversation around what are the additional features you need built around the container you know whether it's it, 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 whether it's you know a heavyweight orchestration system like kubernetes or something a lot more lightweight like nomad or swarm um, whether or not you want to be able to do the stuff like netflix is doing with ci cd you know so you have 20 applications out to all your different sets of users so you can be collecting data i think that's the place where over the next five years, we've got to figure out what do serverless applications look like and all the rest of that. And that's a much more, that is where it gets complex. But just in terms of, you know, customers moving over into containers, I don't think that's too big of a deal. Then there's a whole other level above the pass and cast. And this, this is kind of why I'm asking this question right now is because I don't know. What are the things we're going to build on top? And I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys have seen anything or any use cases yet or... So before we move to another question, I do have an answer. Um, what we have seen so far is that the complexity is already there. And it started from developers trying to push into getting root access to the infrastructure. And they could usually they don't get that, and then they found lots of workarounds for that. So what we are trying to talk about here to, to you is actually standards that, uh, that will help the sysadmin and organization, the infrastructure layer, to put some rules in place and still let the developers have the freedom of innovation that they are looking for. Complexity is already there, in my view. I'm not sure we will have enough time to take all the questions, but the panelists will stay after. Sure. Um, so for me, the, the specific question about uh, CAS versus PaaS. PaaS, when I think of all the PaaSes that came out, I mean, first of all, cloud is a NIST standard. And NIST defined what infrastructure as services and what platform as the services. And when all the different people who created different solutions around those created them, they were following those standards. Uh, containers as a service kind of came about and said, well, we're going to ignore all that stuff. But it doesn't have feature parity as a result to infrastructure as a service and platform as a service for things like self-service, for example, or metered service. So I, that's kind of what I wanted to address uh, from the panel is like, how do you how do you go from infrastructure as a service to something like container as a service when most containers as a service does, don't have all of like the basic features of infrastructure as a service because it doesn't follow a standard? You, in our case, you pile them up. So we, we have our container as a service solution running on top of an infrastructure as a service. And then you get all the benefits and all the goodies from you know, storage, network management on that layer. And then in our case, we, we use Magnum and put Kubernetes and build it sure. on top. 
And one of the things I think is really important to draw out here is, again, that who uses it, right? So um, in the, that IS layer, you got sysadmins, network engineers, DevOps, you know, and all the rest of it. Up in the CAS and PASS layer, you're seeing those usability, app dev, uh, community manager people and stuff like that. So one of the things I think we're really trying to do is actually break down all the barriers, you know? So actually trying to get your application developers to talk to your DevOps so that they can understand each other on each side of their, their layered fence. Because right now, that, I think that's where a lot of organizational breakdown is occurring, is that they don't actually know how to, how to participate with one another on that, that space. Shokong, you had a point? Okay. So a more, more concrete question. So Kubernetes or Swarm? Both. Both. And Nomad and... Do you think they're Mesos? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Do Cloud you think Foundry, that, Cloudify. I'm sorry. Let, let me just finish. Do you think they're comparable products, or they're like things of their own, and we cannot really say, uh, formulate the question like this, one versus another? I think that they are comparable, just like EVM and Xen are comparable. They they have differences, they have strengths, they have weaknesses. Um, I believe both um, Swarm and Kubernetes communities are kind of looking at each other and converging to this central position where um, they, they have the upsides of, of both. Uh, so my answer would be both, like they, depending on what you need to do or, yeah. I think also what you wanna do is look at who their customers are gonna be. So Mesos, because it is got that Apache Hadoop background, they got a bunch of customers who are doing a lot of big data stuff, right? So that's what's gonna happen is that people are gonna come around these things and their use cases are actually gonna form the product. And we need that because we, we need more diversity in this space. We're not, we're not having less and less things, we're having more and more use cases. That's the biggest problem. Yeah, so we need these different um, CASs slash passes to be able to uh, have vertical markets inside of this space and understand what those customers need inside those vertical markets. So, getting, and again, all of these, what's really cool is every single one of them has a community. You know, we are finally in the era of community where go and hang out with that community and see who's there and if, you know, birds of a feather, you know, flock together. So that's the place to go. Uh, David, you said, you know, it's not about uh, either or. It's not IES or VM, uh, uh, IES or containers, but it's, it's a actually and. I know I think that's reasonable, but, you know, if that, if that were to happen, you really need to have a single orchestration uh, layer which can actually orchestrate, you know, that kind of uh, mixed uh, payload environment. Right now, you know, the, one of the challenges we're dealing in our company is, you know, we have Kubernetes, we have OpenStack. If you have some payloads running on OpenStack, some running on Kubernetes, you end up building another higher level orchestration layer which would talk to Kubernetes and OpenStack and maybe uh, another one later on. How do you think uh, th that evolution would happen? Would the OpenStack end up, uh, you know, orchestrating containers as well or would Kubernetes also support VMs in future? I, look, I, I think all of those are a possibility right now. Um, I, I don't know which way it'll to, to go. Um, yeah, no, orchestration, absolutely essential. And, you know, you look at Nova and what they're doing, they have such rich history in the way that they have managed, you know, VMs and bare metal and all the rest of it and the way they're ingrained in containers. But at the same time, there are very definitive use cases for, you know, a, a more heavyweight solution like Kubernetes to be able to do the full-blown pipeline stuff versus just more simple orchestration tools like Heat, like Salt, like Ansible. So I, I don't think we're going to converge in on a single you know, it's not actually going to be the Borg. Borg is an interesting word that Kubernetes came from Borg because we're not going to have a single orchestration language. People have their favorite orchestration and configuration languages, and you're not going to give those up, just like you're not going to give up your favorite programming language, right? You know, it's, it's something you have in your, your arsenal of tools. I think we're out of time. Okay, thank you very much for all the panelists.